Princess Lucinda and the Wand Witch by Malcolm Harris Chapter 1 Lucinda and Millicent stood solemnly at the tree at a Calvary graveyard in Maspeth and Woodside, Queens, in New York City, dressed in black attire. They were there to pay their respects at a funeral, although couldn't attend it in person. The loss of their friend Caitlin weighed heavily on the younger sister's heart. Feeling a mix of anger and grief, Lucinda turned to Millicent and spoke of her guilt. Can't help but feel like Caitlin's death was somehow my fault. Millicent gently placed a comforting hand on Lucinda's shoulder and reassured her. Rest assured, Caitlin's spirit is at peace. Her grandmother believes it was an aneurysm and she's unaware of what truly transpired. But it doesn't feel like they were dealt with properly, Lucinda retorted, her frustration evident. Millicent's voice carried a soothing tone as she explained. I understand your desire for justice, but our powers have their limits. We must trust that Caitlin's grandmother will find solace in her own beliefs. Lucinda, still grappling with the concept of funerals, confessed, I've never been to a funeral before. It all feels so strange to me. Millicent nodded in understanding, acknowledging their unique nature as functionally immortal beings. Funerals are rare for our kind. We rarely experience the passing of loved ones. Curiosity piqued, Lucinda shared her research on human funeral rites, finding them rather mundane. You know it's quite dull compared to our own rituals. A priest speaks, friends speak. They say prayers to their deity, and then they put her in the ground. She scowled, adding, My favourite earth funeral ritual, my favourite earth funeral ritual, is a celebratory one used in New Orleans and parts of the Caribbean. As they scanned the surroundings, Lucinda's eyes caught sight of a familiar face amidst the attendees. Millicent, look over there. It's Ian and his family, she said, a tinge of resentment creeping into her voice. Millicent observed the scene and understood Lucinda's frustration. She explained, Remember, due to the spells we use to conceal Caitlin's true fate and spare her grandmother from grief, people had to forget they ever knew her. However, Ian not only remembers her, but attended school with her. As Lucinda turned her gaze to the side, she noticed a familiar presence standing beside her. It was Caitlin's spirit, ethereal and serene. Lucinda couldn't help but feel a mix of relief and sorrow upon seeing her. I hope you don't mind me summoning your spirit for your funeral, Lucinda said softly, her voice filled with genuine concern. Caitlin's spirit smiled gently. It seems everyone has a chance to see their own funeral, but I can't stay here for long. Millicent, noticing the presence of Caitlin's spirit, approached Lucinda with caution. Lucinda, you shouldn't summon the spirit's dead. It goes against the natural order of things. Caitlin's spirit reassured Millicent. It's all right, Millicent. I understand why Lucinda did it. However, it's time for me to move on. Lucinda's eyes welled up with tears as she asked, almost pleadingly. But have you reconsidered? I can use my magic to bind you to this realm, or even find a way to create a new body for you. A soft sigh escaped Caitlin's spirit as she gently explained. Lucinda, while that may be possible in your home world, the rules of earth and death are not as flexible. I must follow the path set for me. As Caitlin's spirit flickered, a sign of her yearning to move on, Lucinda felt a pang of sadness deep within her. She knew it was time to let go. With a trembling voice, she whispered, I'll miss you, Caitlin. I've learned so much from you. Caitlin's spirit smiled, a bittersweet expression of farewell. Keep making friends, Lucinda, and try to be better. In an attempt to lighten the sombre mood, Lucinda jokingly insisted, But Caitlin, I'm already perfect. Caitlin's spirit chuckled softly, a form fading as she waved goodbye. Goodbye, Lucinda. Lucinda released her hold on the summoning spell, watching as Caitlin's spirit vanished into the ether. 
struggling to hold back tears, she found solace in the falling rain, the droplets blending with her own sorrow. Sensing Lucinda's sadness, Millicent conjured an umbrella to shield them both from the rain. Silently, they stood together, offering support and understanding in the face of loss. As the funeral reached its conclusion, Lucinda couldn't help but be consumed by thoughts of her own parents' deaths. There had been no real chance for her and Millicent to mourn them properly, to grieve the loss in a way that brought closure. The complexities of death and the afterlife in her world lingered in her mind. In her world, magic could bring back the dead. And those who grew weary of centuries or millennia of life could choose to accept death and pass on in their own terms, in their own time. It was a stark contrast to the fragility and brevity of human lives. Watching the humans near her, Lucinda observed their short existence and how their lives seemed focused on trivial matters like wealth and fame. She found some amusement in the frivolity of humanity, but it wasn't enough to ease the ache in her heart. Contrast between their mortal lives and her own immortality only emphasised the profound differences between them. As the rain intensified, mirroring Lucinda's growing sadness, the funeral drew to an end. People hurriedly made their way to their cars, seeking shelter from the downpour. Lucinda, however, felt a strong desire for one last moment. With a swift motion, she teleported close to the gravesite and approached it with a mix of solemnity and reverence. The freshly dug earth of Caitlin's grave stood before her, a stark reminder of the finality of death. Lucinda placed her hand on the tombstone, feeling the cold stone beneath her fingertips. It was a moment of quiet contemplation as she thought of the life that had been lost, the memories that would forever remain. I'll remember you, Caitlin, Lucinda whispered, her voice carrying a hint of sorrow. You were a friend unlike any other, and I won't forget the lessons you taught me. As Lucinda stood there, the rain cascading around her, she allowed herself to mourn, even in her own unique way. The world seemed to fade away as she immersed herself in her memories, cherishing the bond she had shared with Caitlin. Though she couldn't change the circumstances, she could honour the life that had touched her own. With a heavy heart, Lucinda finally stepped back from the gravesite, the rain continuing to drench her. She knew it was time to move forward, to find solace in the connections she still had. The presence of Millicent, standing nearby with an umbrella in hand, offered silent support and understanding. As Lucinda and Millicent stood by the graveside, a cemetery worker approached them, curious about their connection to the girl being buried. Lucinda confirmed that they knew her and shared a brief smile of gratitude for the worker's inquiry. The man, sensing the solemn atmosphere, tried to strike up a conversation, stating, It's always a shame when the young ones like her pass away. Makes you appreciate life, doesn't it? Though, if it weren't for death, I'd probably be out of a job. Lucinda's expression hardened as his words hung in the air. She felt a surge of anger unable to fathom the nonchalance with which he approached the topic of death. Without hesitation, she retorted, Perhaps you should show more reverence for the departed, especially someone like Caitlin. The worker, taken aback by Lucinda's response, quickly apologised, realising his misstep. His face turned pale as he stammered, I'm, I'm sorry if I offended you. I didn't mean any disrespect. It's just a way to cope, you know. Millicent, ever the diplomatic voice, placed a comforting hand on Lucinda's shoulder and interjected, It's all right, sir. We understand that death is a complex topic and everyone copes with it differently. We, we should be going now. Lucinda, still frustrated, reluctantly followed Millicent's lead, but not before shooting the worker a lingering glare. Remember, next time, show some respect, she said her voice laced with a hint of warning. As they walked away, Millicent whispered to Lucinda, It's okay to be upset, but we can't let our emotions get the best of us. 
Caitlin wouldn't have wanted us to stoop to their level. Lucinda nodded, her anger gradually subsiding. Taking a deep breath, she replied, You're right, Millicent. Caitlin deserves better. Let's go. With that, the two sisters resumed their journey, a sombre silence hanging between them. A few steps later, Lucinda couldn't help but turn to Millicent, a mischievous smile tugging at the corners of her lips. You know, she whispered, I was about to turn that man into a two-headed monkey, with the rear end of a warthog and the legs of a crab. Millicent chuckled softly, appreciating her sister's wicked sense of humour. As amusing as that would be, I think Caitlin would have preferred a more dignified approach. Lucinda nodded in agreement, her mischievous expression softening. You're right. Caitlin always saw the best in people. Let's honour her memory by taking the high road. This time. With their understanding sealed, the two sisters continued walking. As they reached a secluded spot, Lucinda extended her hand, conjuring a shimmering portal that would transport them back to their home. Millicent took hold of Lucinda's hand, and together they stepped through the portal, leaving behind the cemetery. As Ari sat in the back of the car, observing the bustling streets of New York City, she couldn't help but feel a sense of wonder. The Haitian driver, Jacques, struck up a conversation, curious if it was her first time in the city. Ari nodded in response and apologised for her English, feeling self-conscious about her language skills. Jacques reassured her, saying her English was better than most natives he encountered. He then shared his own immigrant experience, explaining that New York was built by people like them, who came from different corners of the world. Ari found comfort in his words, feeling a connection with someone who understood the challenges of starting anew. Curiosity got the better of Ari as she glanced at the road signs. She noticed the name of the place she was headed to, Great Neck. Intrigued, she asked Jacques about its origin. He chuckled and shared a local rumour, saying it was named so because of the abundance of fish in the area long ago. But he added, with a hint of concern, that things had been going missing in the area recently including people. Ari's eyes widened, captivated by the mystery unfolding before her. She leaned forward in her seat, curiosity evident in her voice, as she asked, Do you think there's something strange happening here? Like, could it be connected to the disappearances you've mentioned? Jacques glanced at her through the rearview mirror, his expression grave. Honestly? I don't know, he replied, but it's been a topic of discussion amongst the locals. Some say it's just coincidences. Others believe there's something more sinister at play. Ari's mind raced with possibilities, her imagination fueled by the stories she has heard about her cousin and the missing girls. I come from a place where people go missing when they oppose those in power, she shared quietly. It's heartbreaking to think it might be happening here too. Jacques nodded sympathetically. Unfortunately, there's darkness in every corner of the world, he said. But I also believe in the power of unity and fighting against injustice. Perhaps your presence here is a chance to make a difference. Ari pondered his words, realising that her journey to New York might be more significant than she initially thought. She felt a sense of responsibility and determination growing within her. You're right, she said, a voice filled with conviction. I won't stand idly by. I'll do whatever I can to help those who've gone missing and prevent it from happening to others. Jacques smiled warmly at her, his eyes reflecting admiration. That's the spirit, young lady. Never underestimate the power of one person standing up for what's right. As the car continued on, Ari and Jacques engaged in further conversation discussing their shared experiences as immigrants, their dreams and aspirations, and the importance of finding a sense of belonging in a new place. Their conversation provided Ari with a sense of hope and determination, knowing she wasn't alone in her desire to make a positive impact in this unfamiliar city.
Jacques pulls up to a small restaurant with a red brick exterior. Shank it all out. Ari spots her Aunt Jessie standing outside, and she can't help but admire her cool American-style clothing. Jacques parks the car, and Ari bids him goodbye, promising to give him the highest rating. Jacques chuckles and thanks Jessie, accepting a box of Persian cookies called Kulucha as a token of gratitude. Best trip of the day, he says before driving off all smiles.